I've never been described as a bonus, so <laughs> there you go. I'm feeling pretty good about that. I don't know about you, but <laughs> glad you came back for the bonus. How about that? <laughs> what is it then, the Apostle Paul said, I will pray with the Spirit, and I will pray with the understanding also. I will sing with the Spirit. I will sing with the understanding also, 1 Corinthians 14, verse 15. The passage comes from Paul's teaching about spiritual gifts, 1 Corinthians 12, 13, 14. And Paul is emphasizing the need to use those gifts for edifying and the necessity of understanding. And it is the piece of understanding that we are particularly interested in this hour as we discuss the song before us. We need to understand the power of words when we sing, and the force of the message that we convey. When we sing and speak to one another, the Bible says we teach and we admonish, Colossians 3, 16. As we sing, the truth is being spoken to us, and we are then in turn speaking the truth to everyone else. Now, I don't know how much time and attention you've given your songbooks recently, but not every song in the songbook that we sing simply sets forth the facts of the gospel. There are many songs that do. But neither is it the case that every song that we sing simply extols the greatness of God, although there are many songs that do. Sometimes the songs we sing cause us personally to set forth declarations and affirmations of faith and conviction. Singing these songs then is different because we are now singing or saying something, not about God, but about ourselves. We are singing something before others and to others. We're singing something toward and to God and in the presence of God. To that end, there is a reality that must be faced by us all. God made us individuals. God is in an individual relationship with every one of us. And the examples set forth in Scripture are designed in part to teach us that very fact. While we could talk a lot about nations in the Bible, generally and for the most part, when we're reading through the scriptures, we're reading about individuals. There is Adam and Eve in Genesis chapter 3. And these two people serve as an object lesson for us to learn. And that lesson is this. Each person is accountable to the God of heaven individually. When they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the midst of the garden, Genesis 3, 7, the Bible says they hid themselves. When God called out to them and asked them where they were, Adam said, I was afraid, and so I hid myself. And God asked Adam, why were you afraid? Have you eaten of the tree which I commanded you not to eat thereof? Friends, listen to me. Zone in and look and listen to the conversation. It's God, and it's Adam. Have you eaten of the tree that I told you not to eat of? We hear Adam say, the woman you gave to be with me, she gave me of the tree, and I did eat. And isn't the next verse in your Bible something like this? And God excused Adam because Eve gave him the fruit. Cain and Abel, we understand which one of these individuals were righteous. God asked Cain, why are you wroth? Why is your countenance fallen? If you do well, you will be accepted. But if you do not well, sin lieth at the door. Genesis 4, 1 through 8, God returned to Cain and says, where is your brother? What have you done? Genesis 6, we read of the world 
had become so wicked, given itself so far into sin that every imagination of the thoughts of man's heart was only evil continually. It repented God that he had made man, grieved him at his heart, but Noah, just one person, Noah in contrast to the world, Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. There is Abraham, Genesis 15, 6, who believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. And James says, after offering Isaac, the scripture was fulfilled, which saith Abraham believed God, and it was counted him for righteousness. He was called the friend of God. David was a man after God's own heart. What's the point? It's simply this. We're in individual relationships with God. And we cannot blame or make excuses and involve anyone else. Each one of us sings this song before us this afternoon. Each one of us then must make sure the words that we sing are true of us individually. Consider the song and let the pertinent words jump off the page at you if you will. You'll hear them very quickly. The first verse says this, all to Jesus I surrender. All to him I freely give. I will ever love and trust him. In his presence daily live. Verse number two says, all to Jesus I surrender. Humbly at his feet I bow. Worldly pleasures all forsaken. Take me, Jesus. Take me now. Well, then there's the third stanza. All to Jesus I surrender. Lord, I give myself to thee. Fill me with thy love and power. Let thy blessing fall on me. And then we sing, I surrender all. I surrender all. I surrender all. I surrender all. All to thee, my blessed Savior, I surrender all. I will sing with the Spirit. I will sing with the understanding also. Teach and admonish one another. Why should we surrender all? We'll pick apart the song, the song momentarily. Let's talk about a few reasons why. Number one, because the Godhead has given all. Romans 8.32, God gave us all that heaven had to give. He that spared not his own son delivered him up for us all, the Bible says. But not only did the Father give all, Jesus gave all. Matthew 20 and 28, just as the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to give his life a ransom for many. The Holy Spirit didn't give some or part. He gave all. John 16, 13, the Bible says, but when he, the Spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all the truth. We should because the Father, the Word, and the Spirit has given all. We should because Christ commanded us to do the same. In fact, as the song says, I surrender all. Surrender is the basis of discipleship. If one is not willing to surrender, he can't have a relationship with Jesus. Well, surrender what? Surrender family. Luke 14, 26, 27, Jesus says, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yea, in his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not carry his own cross and come after me, he cannot be my disciple. If one is not willing to surrender, he can't have a relationship with Jesus, but not only family. Jesus met a man. The man ran up to him. He asked the Lord, what good thing must I do? Good master, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus knew what the man needed to surrender, and so he told him, surrender your money. That's Mark 10 and verse 21. As the man turned and walked away, the Bible says, looking at him, Jesus loved him. He said to him, one thing you lack, go and sell all you possess, give to the poor, take up your, you will have treasure in heaven, come, follow me. The 
individual wasn't willing to part with his money. Jesus says we must surrender self. The first and great commandment is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your might, all your strength. Luke 9, 23, if an individual is not willing to deny himself, take up his cross, he cannot be my disciple, Jesus says. Let's explore the song in the time we have remaining, and maybe if we have time, we'll make some application, try and make some points as we near an end. Verse 1 says, all to Jesus I surrender, all to him I freely give. Friends, I don't want to put you on the spot this evening or afternoon, and I don't want you to believe that somehow I am looking at you and questioning your Christian. Friends, not about me. We all sing the song. The song leader stands up and he calls out the number, and it's this song. And every one of us gets a book, and every one of us looks at the screens, and every one of us starts saying these words. Every one of us needs to know we're saying that in the presence of God. We're saying that as a true statement. I don't know how you sing or what you do when you sing. I can only trust we're not going through the motion. I can only trust that our minds and hearts are somewhere else as we simply mouth the words. And maybe it's the case that if we did understand the force and gravity of the words we were singing, maybe we tell the song leader, don't sing that one. Because this song says, as a declaration of truth, as an affirmation of conviction, in fact, as a statement of something that has already happened, all to Jesus I surrender. All to him I freely give. I will ever love and trust him in his presence daily live. We are making an announcement and singing it one to another. And it's an individual announcement. The song doesn't say, you know, I believe my wife has surrendered all to Jesus. That's not the lyrics. The song doesn't say, you know, I'm so glad the elders and the preacher have given their all to Jesus. That's not what it says. No, it's a bold statement. It's a declarative statement. It is, I surrender. Christianity is nothing if it's not personal. Each one of us must stand for or against Jesus. Jesus said, he that is not with me is against me. He that gathereth not with me scattereth abroad. It admits of volunteerism. It says, all to him I freely give. Service to God is a free will offering. That's how they got the tabernacle built. Whosoever is of a willing heart, let him freely give. They gave so much, they had to be stopped. Nobody has to pull teeth from a Christian for service. Nobody has to manipulate Christians for service. No one has to guilt, and I'm so thankful that God is not a God of guilt. He doesn't bend and twist your arm behind your back. He doesn't go out of his way to make you feel bad. No, sir, no, ma'am. We do that all on our own. And then we sing to God, all to him I freely give. We freely give our service or we don't. When we sing this song, we're saying, I do. We freely offer ourselves to Jesus it's exactly what the relationship between God and man is. Jesus stands in the presence of humanity and says, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you will find rest unto your soul. For my yoke is easy, my burden is light. Now whosoever will, the spirit and the bride say, let him come. And we came. And now we're saying, all to him I freely give. It says a promise of faithfulness. I will ever love and trust him. Do you? Will you? Aren't you amazed at church fights? Aren't you confused when Christians go in one with another? Aren't you a little perplexed when Christians feel like they're asking me to do something else? When what we sing is, I'll ever. 
her love and trust him. We heard this morning an outstanding job about the difference between happiness and joy. And what we're seeing is joy. I have a deep-seated abiding joy that is not dealt with, but it's not changed or altered by circumstances. I've heard some people say, I used to believe in God. What happened? What could have turned you around? What could have taken your belief and conviction in the God of heaven? He hasn't changed. Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever. God hasn't changed. I am the Lord. I change not. And what we sing is, I will ever love and trust him. It's a faith won by understanding the infinite nature of God. Every promise God has made, God can keep. It's a it's an understanding of the character of God, the perfect, flawless character of God. Every promise God has made, he will keep. And it promises this faith forever in God's unchanging ways. It says, I will ever love and trust him. It's comforted by his presence. In fact, it says as much, in his presence daily live. It's comforted by the fact that he sees me. I will not fear. What can man do to me? God sees me. He's watching over me. The eyes of the Lord are open unto the, unto the righteous. The ears are open unto their prayers. The face of the Lord is against them that do evil. I daily live in the presence of God. What can man do to me? From Rockford, Illinois to Russia, God watches over his children. He sees me. He knows me. The hairs of my head are numbered. He watches over me. And so daily I live in his presence. Verse 2, all to Jesus I surrender. Humbly at his feet I bow. Worldly pleasures all forsaken. Take me, Jesus, take me now. We sing that, and then some Christians act like, Lord, don't ever come back. And yet we sing, take me, Jesus, take me now, right now. If you don't take the rest of them, come get me. It says he's divine. Humbly at his feet I bowed. John tried to bow down to an angel, and the angel stopped him and said, See that you do it not. There's only one worthy of you bowing down before. Understand that he is preeminent. It understands who I am. In his presence, I should be on my face prostrate. In his presence, I should be the one humbled by the occasion. In his presence, I kick off my shoes. I'm standing on holy ground. It's an understanding of that, and so it admits of humility. In his presence, I humbly bow. Understands that he is worthy of the reverence. Understand that God resists the proud, James 4, 6 through 10. But then it says this, worldly pleasures all forsaken. It understands materialism. It understands not simply that I should not give my life to greed and avarice, but learn contentment, but it also understands that this world is not my home, and there's more to life than this place. John says as well in 1 John 2, 15 to 17, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him for all that's in the world. This person understands that, and so I've forsaken all the worldly pleasures. I've given up all sinfulness and sensual pleasure, Ephesians 5, 3. The Apostle Paul says, let none of these things be once named among you as become its saints. The Apostle Paul would say it this way in Philippians, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and do count them but dung. We were the servants of sin, but now, because of Jesus, I've surrendered all to him. I've given up worldly pleasure and I've forsaken it. The third stanza says, all to Jesus, I surrender, Lord, I give myself to thee. Fill me with thy love and power. Let thy blessings fall on me. You read through the book of Job. There is an interesting statement at the end. It's Job 42 where God speaks from the whirlwind and talks to Job. And while Job had three friends... God names one of them. And he says, Eliphaz, you have not spoken of me the things that are right, as my servant Job has. That certainly doesn't mean the other two didn't speak the things that are right, because Job prayed for all three of them. But if you read through the book, you'll come to chapter 4, and that particular person, Eliphaz, makes up this elaborate story about what he has seen and heard and how an angel appeared before him. And as I read through the book of Job, I got to the end, and I heard God name that man, and it dawned on me 
that God listens to what I say about him. Here is a man saying something about God in the presence of God. When we sing, that's precisely what we do. This stanza says, all to Jesus I surrender. Lord, I give myself to thee. It's a pledge to Jesus of our whole being. The first and great commandment, our thoughts, our words, and our deeds, our time, possession, and our things, our body, our soul, and our minds, we're saying in that verse, nothing I have, no one that I love, not even myself, will come before Jesus. In fact, like the Macedonians in 2 Corinthians 8, 5, I give myself. When we give ourselves to the Lord, everything else we have should also be given. And it's giving of ourselves that leads to the next thought, and that is a plea for communion. Since I've given myself to you, Lord, fill me with your love and power. And the reason God can fill us with his love is because we've emptied ourselves of us. Which is again the first thing Jesus says, if you will be my disciple. Matthew 5 and verse 3, after sitting down and opening his mouth, he said, blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed is the individual who has emptied himself of himself. And because he's empty of self, he's impoverished in spirit, he can now be filled with the mind of Jesus. Every one of us who sings this song says, I've done that. I'm not thinking about doing that. I'm not on my way to doing that. No, no. What we sing is, Lord, I give myself to thee. I must be humble then so I can be instructed. I must be willing so I can follow his example. I must be free of, free of pride so I can serve him. The Apostle Paul says it well and. Philippians 2 and verse number 5 beginning, let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus. It is interesting to me that some Christians actually believe that it's somebody else's fault what their present relationship is with the Lord. That somebody else is holding them back. No, you can get as close to God as you desire. There is nobody preventing you. In fact, we say, I've done it, Lord. I'm giving myself. I give myself. Paul says, let this mind be in you, which is also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbed to be equal with God, made himself of no reputation, took upon himself the form of a servant. Brothers and sisters, neighbors and friends, you know what the Lord's church is full of or should be? Everywhere you go, there should be an audience and a congregation of servants. And if you're a member in any congregation, how can you not be one? Can you imagine whole congregations being full of the mind of Jesus? Can you imagine whole congregations saying, here am I, send me? Can you imagine whole congregations saying, Lord, I give myself to thee? There is within it a faithful expectation. Let thy blessings fall on me. The blessings are in the surrender. The individual surrenders to Jesus and the blessings will fall. Now that is certainly not as is purported among religionists in the denominational world as, as, as the, the, the prophet religion where God's going to outgive you and he's going to bless you real good and give you something. No, sir, no, ma'am. The, the blessings in Scripture are spiritual blessings. In fact, if you want a real insight into God's, and I don't want to say this incorrectly, so I don't really want to use the expression God's interest. That's not really what I mean. I'm trying to find the right word and sometimes they're nuanced. So let me say this. Insofar as the way scripture describes our physical place or level of contentment and what ought to be the expectation, 1 Timothy 6, 6 through 10 covers it pretty good. There the apostle Paul says, for we brought nothing into this world. So let's do this. Let's start with zero. And let's build from there. 
when you came here, you came with nothing. Didn't even come with clothes. Nothing. We brought nothing into this world. Now let's fast forward to the grave. And it's certain you will carry nothing out. So we have the beginning, zero. We have the end, zero. Where's the level of contentment in the middle? And having food and raiment. Let us be there with content. Physically, then, that makes every one of us abundantly rich. So what's God's interest? Spiritual. Let your blessings fall on me. How about forgiveness? How about redemption? How about salvation and communion and fellowship? How about a relationship from an enemy to a son or a daughter? How about a location out of darkness and into his marvelous light? How about providence, meat for the master's use? How about a purge or a cleared conscience or sanctification, justification, maturation? How about heard prayers and answered prayers? Let your blessings fall on me. The song closed by restating the same again and again. I surrender all. I surrender all. I surrender all. All to thee, my blessed Savior. I surrender all. The Apostle Paul says, what is it then? I'll sing with the spirit. I'll sing with the understanding also. I trust that every one of us understands what we're singing. When we sing the song, all to Jesus, I surrender. All to him, I freely give. Not to the church, not to the preacher, not to the elders, not to the brothers and sisters. All to him I freely give worldly pleasures, all forsaken. The Apostle Paul is a fine example of this. I'm thankful that we're going to study the book of Philippians this week. Because as you work your way through that book, you will meet an individual who repeatedly sets forth his conviction about how and why he has surrendered all. It could be that we understand the force of these words, and so we tend to modify them just slightly. We offer a good substitute, but it's not quite the same. And so we say things like, give God your best. The truth of the matter is God doesn't want your best. Your best can be fudged, first of all. Your best is subjective, second of all. And your best is often compared to other people, third of all. The song doesn't say, I give my best to God. God wants what we sing. All to Jesus. I surrender. All to him I freely give. May God strengthen and bless every one of us not to just sing this, but to live it. Thank you. May God bless you.